I'm Tom Hoyle, I'm an earth science researcher and I specialise in using archaeological and geological records in order to reconstruct past climate, environments, sea level change and biodiversity. I'd like to take a couple of minutes along with my colleague Sifan Kariche in order to show you some of the key findings of the research we've carried out over the last 10 years because we think that it really has some key applications and some key lessons for the current climate and biodiversity crises. For the last five to six years, I have focused on studying large lakes. Lakes are either part of river system and flows to global ocean, for example, Lake Victoria, or they are totally isolated and are part of closed basins over the land. For instance, if you take uh, Caspian Sea, we know that sea level is increasing in reaction to the climate change globally. What is not quite well known is in some areas with isolated basin over land area, sea level is actually going down. That's mainly due to water being lost to the atmosphere through evapotranspiration and then transported to other parts of the world. To help you visualize those processes, imagine you had a bowl of water and you left it out in your garden for several days. If it was really rainy over those several days, then the water level would rise and eventually it would overflow. But if it was sunny and you had no rain over that time, then eventually the water would evaporate and the water level would fall. It's exactly the same processes that govern the size and the depth of inland seas such as the Caspian Sea. Communities set up certain infrastructures on lake edges, such as fisheries, ports, hydrocarbon terminals, hydroelectric terminals. When sea level rises or falls, the coastline shifts. When sea level fault occurs, it's essentially the same as the tide going out and staying out. So you will end up with coastal infrastructure that's potentially kilometers or even tens of kilometers away from the coast. In order to mitigate those dangers, it's very important to quantify whether sea level is going up or going down. To achieve this, uh, we can use evidence from geological and archaeological records to understand how sea level have changed in the past. We then use air system models, which are computer codes that estimates the solution to differential equations of fluid motions and thermodynamics and help us understand the physical, chemical and biological processes that interact to shape our planet and the organisms that lives on it. Some of the case studies that we've used involve the central Eurasian seas, in particular two good examples of the Caspian Sea and the Aral Sea. So the Caspian Sea is it's a very large lake, the largest lake in the world, and it provides ecosystem services to millions of people around its coast. We can see from the geological record that in the past, the Caspian Sea has undergone sea level changes of up to hundreds of meters and coastline shifts of hundreds of kilometers. But we don't even need to look into the geological record to see the importance of sea level change in this region. Looking at the Aral Sea, it's all but vanished in a matter of decades. These two photos, for example, were taken only 21 years apart, and it's disappeared entirely during my lifetime. Also, complete desiccation of the entire Caspian Sea isn't likely in the near future. The northern part of the Caspian Sea, nearly one third of the area, is very shallow and is therefore vulnerable to desiccation and huge coastline shifts with only relatively small changes in water level. So going back to the analogy of the bowl of water that we used earlier, if we have a shallow and wide bowl of water, then losing a centimetre of water depth will cause quite a massive reduction in the area of the water. Whereas if we have a narrow and deep bowl, that same centimetre loss will cause practically no difference in the surface area of the water. Using that analogy, it's then quite easy to understand that the northern region of the Caspian, where the average water depth is maybe only six metres, is far more susceptible to desiccation than the southern and the middle basins, which are much deeper. So our investigation showed that combined impacts of future water extraction for domestic purposes and irrigation and combined with climate change, the shallow six meter average depths of northern part of the Caspian Sea is at clear risk of desiccation occurring at some point before the end of the 21st century if proper mitigation and conservation measures are not put in place. This will have multifaceted implication for the surrounding communities, increasing freshwater scarcity, transformation of ecosystems, and impacting the climate system itself. If you're interested in our research, please do check out the links below, which will lead you to some of our papers and other videos.